There we go. We'll give it a few moments while folks join. All right, good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Jessica from Greenlight and we are thrilled, like literally thrilled and honored to be hosting tonight's event with Robert Jones Jr. launching his brand new book, The Prophets. He's gonna be talking with Kiese Lehman, so you are in for an excellent evening. Before we start, I just wanna say a huge thanks to Robert, to Kiese and to the team at Putnam for making this happen and to all of you for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces right now, our community of authors and readers is still here. So we're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Just a couple little housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see and hear you. They can see that you're here though, and you can see a count of fellow attendees at the top of your Zoom screen. There's a couple different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like a speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. It's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. We are recording tonight's event, so look for video or audio versions on our social media channels later on. And importantly, tonight's featured book, The Profits, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person at our bookstore locations, 12 p.m. to 7 p.m. every day of the week, or you can purchase Robert's book and, and you can purchase Robert's book and many others on site, or you can order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the US. The great thing is we actually have signed copies of The Profits available and Robert is even personalizing copies for fans. So when you order online, you can put your signing or personalization request in the order comments field at checkout. I'll drop that by link in the chat in just a moment. All right, introductions. Our interviewer tonight is Kiese Lehman. He's the award-winning author of Heavy, an American memoir, which was named best book of 2018 by the New York Times, Publishers Weekly, NPR, and many more. He's also the author of the essay collection, How to Slowly Kill Yourself and Others in America and the novel Long Division. He teaches at the University of Mississippi and has taught at Vassar College in the Iowa Writers Workshop. Kessie has appeared on the Greenlight stage many times, virtually in our stores and at other venues to discuss his own work and others work. And we're so grateful to have him back with us tonight for this special event. He's gonna be speaking with our featured author, Robert Jones Jr. He was born and raised in New York City and received his BFA in creative writing with honors and MFA in fiction from Brooklyn College. He's written for numerous publications, including the New York Times, Essence, OK Africa, The Feminist Wire, and The Grio. He's the creator of the social justice, social media community, Son of Baldwin. Jones was recently featured in T Magazine's cover story, Black Male Writers of Our Time. His new novel, The Prophets, is the tale of the union between two enslaved young men on a deep south plantation, the refuge they find in each other, and a betrayal that threatens their existence. In addition to being passionately loved and recommended by booksellers at Greenlight and at many other great bookstores, this debut has garnered praise from fellow authors, including Marlon James, Ocean Vuong, R.O. Kwan, Helen Phillips, and tonight's interviewer, Kiese Lehman, who writes, The Prophets is easily the most superb tutorial in writing and loving I have ever read. I'm convinced Morrison, Baldwin, and Bambara sat around sipping wine one night, talking about the day we'd read an offering like The Prophets. Robert Jones Jr. is a once in a generation cultural worker whose art thankfully will be imitated for generations. So you are in for something really special tonight. Robert's gonna start us off with a reading from the book and then he'll be talking with Kiese and with all of you. Robert, please take it away. Thank you everyone for coming. I am so humbled by this. Um, thank you to Kiese for agreeing to do this. He's the greatest to me. So this is this is quite an honor. Um, at Kiese's request, I'm going to read a section, a, sh a short section from the prophets, wherein um, the ancestors are speaking directly to the reader and also directly to the characters um, in ways that remind us of who we are, where we come from, and where we should be going. And this uh, chapter is called Genesis, appears somewhere like toward the beginning of the book. Here, is not where we begin, but it is where we shall begin for you to know us, for us to know you, but mainly for you to know yourself. 
We have names, but they are names you can no longer pronounce without sounding as foreign as your captors. That is not to condemn you. Believe us, we know the part we played in it, even if just through our ignorance and fascination with previously unknown things. Forgive us. The only way we can repay that debt is by telling you the story that we give to you through our blood. All memory is kept there, but memory is not enough. You are the vessel, you see. So that is why you must not give in to the temptation of the long sleep. Who will tell it if not you? You can never be an orphan. You can never be an orphan. Do you understand? The night sky itself gave birth to you and covers you and names you as her children above all others. Firstborn, best adored, highest thought, most loved and despise not the dark of your skin, for within it is the prime sorcery that moved us from belly crawl to tall walk. From the screaming, we brought forth words and mathematics and the dexterity of knowledge that coaxed the ground to offer up itself as sustenance. But do not let this make you arrogant. Arrogant brings you lower, down from the mountaintops where you were breastfed, like where you are now, down in the bottomless where separation is normal and joy is found in indecent places. To fold yourself in on yourself is where you will find power, risen out of circles at the bottoms of oceans, by hands that stitched the cosmos so that it might be primed at the beginning of everything. A little pageantry never hurt anyone. It is all right for you to find humor in that. We like to hear your laughter. You must know that you come from the place where fathers held you and mothers hunted for your pleasure, holding great spears and dancing, carrying you shoulder high and celebrating victory. You still do the dance. We see you. You still do the dance. It is part of what you are. A hand is unfurling in its own time, which seems too long to know. It seems too long to you, we know but you must be patient. We will not judge you harshly if you succumb to the pain. It is a lot to ask of everyone, especially you, so cut off from where you are supposed to be. Return to memory when you are filled with doubt, though memory is not enough. There are no lines, for everything is a circle turning back on itself endlessly. This is not to make you dizzy, but to give you the chance to get it right the next time. We know that you have questions. Who are we? Why do we only whisper to you? Why do we only come to you in dreams? Why do we dwell only in the dark? Answers soon come. We, the seven, promise. Fold in, children. Fold in. All right. Brother man, how you doing? You can hear me? Yes. yes. First of all, thank Robert, you for coming. Thank you, fam. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, you Robert just informed me that six years ago today, I sent Robert a message that said, "You're a superhero." Was it a question mark or was it a period? It was a question mark. Are you a superhero? Are you a superhero? Because Six years ago today, I found out that Robert Jones and Son of Baldwin were the same person. And, you know, I'm a fat black boy from Mississippi, no matter what, no matter how old I am, no matter how much I weigh. And I found Son of Baldwin when I most needed to believe in home. And then I met Robert Jones virtually and I felt home in Robert Jones, but I never put the two together. I never realized that Son of Baldwin and Robert Jones was the same person, right? So we become, we become. I, I will say family and friends. I love you. I want to start off by saying I love you dearly. And I knew you were cooking up something that we never seen, fam. I knew you were cooking it up based on our conversations, based on some of what I'd seen from your writing. I knew that when I read the novel that you agreed to send to me that it was going to be something that I'd never seen. I 
I just had no idea, bro. I just want to start by saying this. And I think, I think Zoom lends itself to hyperbole. So I just want to say I'm not being hyper hyperbolic. When I read The Prophets, all I could think about was what Morrison would think. Not even Baldwin. I was like, what would Morrison think? And I, I, I saw her and felt her dancing. And there's so much dancing and there's so much body and there's so much love and there's so much brutality in this book. And there's so much subtext and so much skill. And I, had, I have never seen a novelist pull off what you just pulled off, brother. So beyond thank you for creating Isaiah and Samuel, beyond thank you for creating a polyphonic fucking like multi uh, 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 narrative voiced like epic Thank you for showing me that you can rigorously politically love us. And by us, I'm saying, I'm talking about black folk. I'm talking about queer folk. I'm talking about us. Thank you for showing me that you could do this and, and not overwhelm the novel. And I just wanna start this whole conversation fam by asking you, how were you able to do everything you've done in that book in terms of like the different slices of love and not overwhelm the narrative. Can we just start there? This is gonna be a writer's lover's talk, just letting y'all know. Let's start there. Um, that's a good question because there were times in writing it that I felt like I might be overwhelming it. And what that required from me was getting real still and real quiet about what should and should not be included in the book. And so this is over a process of from pen to paper first time to pen to paper last time, 14 years I don't know. Of, of writing. And so there's a lot on the cutting room floor. Characters that I adored that did not make it into the novel because it just was too much. So this was um, instinct. It was also the sharp eye of Sally Kim, as well as the, the wise counsel of PJ Mark that helped me sort of understand why sh something should be there, why something should not be there. Um, because even though I pulled at least four off the top of my head, I pulled four characters out of the book there, there's a one character who had a small role who, whose role became much bigger, that's Sarah. Um, and because Sally asked a really great, great question, I was able to just kind of like maneuver it so that, all right, now I have all of these different points of view, but they're all like slices of the same pie. Mm. So as opposed to, okay, I have orange over here and green over here and blue over here. And this is just like not coming together as a rainbow. It, it just worked mm. because of, of the ability to one recognize when I was falling in love with my writing when I shouldn't have been. Mm. Um, and realizing that it ain't about me. It, like, mm. like I'm in service to, I'm, I'm in service to, and I'm a witness for these people that I'm, that the story is coming from somewhere outside of me yeah. to put down on the paper. So how that comes together is part divine and just part hard fucking work. Brother, when when the characters, when the characters talk to you and 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 and, and make you smell their funk, make you smell them, right? Because you I can tell you smell these characters, right? How do you know? Or how do you feel when they've talked to you so intimately? And for this project, though they got you to page 74 and got you to ultimately page 399, how do you feel about those characters and those voices? And I'm just gonna say like those people who visited you, whose actual character might not have made it. Like, how do you deal with that? Um, the characters that did made it, I love them. Um, even when they were cruel to me mm -hmm. um, because they would, I would write something and they go, you know, you lying. 
And so I had to fix it, even though I thought that was beautiful, but the, the, the beauty was a lie. They wanted me to show the ugly. And so I put the ugly down. And the characters that did not make it, um, I mourn them um, because, but I realized that maybe their stories can be told at another time. Um, so I'm hoping that I'm, I'm able to do that at some point. I do not want to return to this time period. Um, this was some grueling work to, um, to witness and to, you start to take on the, the character's pain. And it's hard, like you hear actors sometimes say, I, I, I couldn't stop being that character. Like it was really, um, Michael B. Jordan talked about how it was hard for him to pull out um, when he was playing um, homeboy that got shot in, in, um, in Oakland. You become these characters for a moment. And so it was really hard to, when Samuel gets hit or Isaiah gets hit and I start feeling that pain in my own back. I was like, I can't, I can't go back to this. I can only tell this story one time. Um, but the characters that get left out, maybe they, maybe they return as ghosts in some other story. Oh, you're on mute. My bad. One of the things um, you bringing up, uh, Oscar Grant makes me think about, and, and actually Michael B. Jordan's rendition of Oscar Grant was one of the things I really loved about that narrative was the way it 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 did not sort of like it it, it made you catch up. And one of the things that you do, Robert, um, I mean, my God, my nigga, like if I mean we make books, bro, and and we read the greatest makers of books. And even the greatest makers of books, if you read as much as I think we read, you can see sometimes when even Morrison seen, and I'm gonna say something, people might not disagree, but I can see sometimes where more, I can feel sometimes when Morrison is a little hesitant to try something, right? I, I mean, and, and she and she often she often pulls it off. But what you did in this book from page one, and actually from the from the relationship of the character from like, you didn't make, you didn't create that story where like, here are these two men, they sort of like each other or do they, are they gonna fall in love? Are they actually gonna touch? No, 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 no. First chapter fan. Can you talk about why it was so important for in the first chapter that actually moves forward for us to see these two enslaved young black men in Mississippi loving each other's soul, their bodies, their fleshy parts, their wetness. From, 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 from chapter one, can we talk about that? Yes, that was incredibly important to me, given the hostile spaces we live in, where all of the images in some way, shape or form, whether um, overtly or, or, or covertly, show us at each other's throats. That um, black men can never have any intimacy or tenderness with one another, platonic or otherwise. Um, that the wages of being a black man in this country is that you have to treat another black man as nothing, that you can't even touch him, that everything becomes toxic between you. I wanted to, to immediately strike that from the record because my experiences, many of my experiences growing up, um, the men loved each other. Not my grandfather, he was the, the patriarch and he was in the nation of Islam and he was not here for that. But the other men in my life were tender. My father was a very tender, sensitive man and the world beat him up because of it. I wanted to show right off the bat, one, when, when love is in the air, it should be revered. When two black men love each other, it should be celebrated. And when there is a level of intimacy, even if it's sexual between two black people, it should be gorgeous. And so I said, um, just so everyone who's reading this knows what this book is and what they're gonna get when they, when they open the pages, let me put it all up front, right at the beginning. So you can decide 
whether you're going to witness or whether you're going to turn away. Yes, fam. Oh. Um, yeah. 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 And 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 I'm wondering like about confidence and death. I want to put those two in conversation. Okay. Um book making, right? Is 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 a hard thing. Love making is far harder. I think what you've done to me in this book is you've showed me part and parcel of, of like what can happen to the writerly sensibility if you think about love making and book making actually as the same thing. I'm not saying that's what you think you did. I'm saying that's what it felt like I did. I get asked this question all the time, and it's and it's 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 not a clumsy question, but but I hear it clumsily. So I want to ask the question that I wish people would ask me. People okay. often ask me, who were you writing to? What were your audiences? We can talk about that shit if we want. I'm much more interested, Robin, like, what did you want the audiences you love most to feel? I'm much more interested in that than like, who were you writing to and blah, blah, blah. Like, what did you want them to feel and do and, 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 and be while reading and post reading? I think that's a harder question, but can, you, can, we, can we start trying to dig into that? Yes, yes. Um, there are two things that I wanted a particular audience to get from this. Love and anger. Mm -hmm. Because to me, um, those two verbs are the, are the ones that move us most readily. Um, whether we, we love some, something so much we, we're willing to die for it, or something upsets us so much that we're willing to die for it. Like it's those two things. So I'm I'm hoping that what comes out of reading this book is more art. I want somebody to be so moved or so angered or so enamored that they go and paint that painting that has been sitting on their heart for, for seven years and they didn't think they could do it. Mm -hmm. Or that black queer writer who said, nah, nobody's gonna read this. Right. Or that 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 singer with that voice that's like Whitney Houston's, who still no one ever told her that she could sing like that, so she kept her mouth shut. I want her to open it out and scream outside the window. Mm. I want black people to join hands metaphorically or literally in a way that cannot that bond cannot be broken. That's, that, that's what I want. I want us to love each other fiercely as Ntozake Shenge would have said. Um, I want us to come out of this saying, what harm did I cause and what art could I produce to lessen it? Yes. And what you remind me, Robert, in this book is that ferocity, artistic ferocity and artistic tenderness necessarily have to go hand in hand. For example, you know, I think people who might read about this book are gonna know that it's about Isaiah and Samuel, right? These two, in, in the, 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 these, these two like absolutely complicated, beautiful young black men um, whose love and, 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 and touch, you know, ultimately impact and affect the past, the future, everything. But it's so much more than that. And I wanna talk about the ferocity it took you to not make this an endangered black male narrative, to think and talk about the ways that folk who are femme and particularly like black women, historically and futuristically have to not just like serve as backup singers to the narrative, but are as equally engines of this narrative as Isaiah and Samuel. Can we talk about the ferocity and ultimately the tenderness it takes to weave that into this narrative? You know what? I who I have to thank are those who came before me, whose, whose sh shoulders I stand on. Toni Morrison, okay. Alice Walker, Gloria Naylor, Octavia Butler, Gail Jones, Tony K. Bambara, um, Zora Neale Hurston, Harriet Jacobs, Phyllis Wheatley. Like I can go on and on and on and on about the, the ferocious brilliance 
of the black women who have been writing for the longest time and who have been discounted, but who have created the greatest works of art on the planet. Let's just be clear. Who, who is better than Toni Morrison? Like name, name the person. Oh, um, so first I wanted to pay homage to that. And the other thing is my personal belief is that, so we, we all come from a masculine feminine energy, mm. uh, mother, father, whatever it is, those binaries. And maybe sometimes not even binary or maybe sometimes too masculine, too feminine. Right. Um, but the point is that we are, we are made up of all of these things. And when they are out of balance, which when to me, what, that's what toxic masculinity actually is. It's the masculinity that's out of balance because it's shunning its, um, its counterpart, what it's, what it's supposed to be joined with, which is the femininity, which makes us whole. Um, I needed to push back against that by paying particular attention to um, those black women, those black femmes, those black mages, those black queer people who are often portrayed as secondary, mm. unimportant, um, portrayed as um, hapless victims with no agency and no autonomy. Um, it was important that I invested all of the characters who fit into that, those identities with all of the interiority that I know they have mm. because they're human beings. And um, I found tons of examples of this when I went through the works of all those um, brilliant women that I named. I also found it in Baldwin. Mm. I found it in Wallace Thurman. Mm. Um, Kiese, I found it in Long Division. Mm. Um, and side note, Long Division is one of the novels that gave me permission to write The Prophets. Um, I have a list of 10 novels that like, if it weren't for these 10 novels, this book could not have been. And Long Division is one of those books. And I know it's about to come out again and I can't <laughs> wait. I can't wait to see that. But um, it's, it's all because I, don't, I didn't look at the writers that I'm um, in conversation with like you or the writers that paved the way for us as competition, but I look at us all as community. And I drew on that in order to ensure that um, those who have been erased or made secondary were given their turn. And another thing you do is you don't allow the continent to take up this sort of shaded amorphous space, right? Like you take us back to the continent and, and, and uh, I think the chapter is, is it King Ones? Is that the first chapter you take us, you take King One? Yeah. And again, it, it's interesting when you do these book talks on the first day, cause you don't want to give away uh, too much. <laughs> but, but fam, like, can you talk about the work and, and, and the research that you had to do in order to craft um, King One as a chapter? Let's talk about that chapter. And, okay. and, and let folks know what happens in that chapter as much as you feel comfortable, because I don't want to be the one to drop the spoilers if, if I'm spoiling. Okay, so what Kiese is referring to is that um, there are several chapters in the novel interspersed throughout where um, the ancestors take us back to the continent for us to um, sort of re reevaluate our relationship to that continent and what we think about that continent, how we um, mythologize it, how we pathologize it. Um, and the first foray into that is a chapter called First Kings, which is you know an allusion to the Bible. And in that chapter, we get to meet a king who is a woman. And it took me a, a really long time because I'm, I'm educated in a Western system. And so I think of the way Americans think of gender and race and sexuality as universal. And it's not universal whatsoever. M man, woman is a construction, um, just like everything else is. And so um, what I learned in researching, because I, I studied 
um, Africana studies as a minor when I was an undergrad. And I was reading all of these works where I was finding out about um, female kings and male wives and, you know, just these really um, unusual to me because I had not been exposed to it before, um, ideas about gender and gender identity. So I did a ton of research outside of literature. So I was looking at anthropological works and sociological works and historical works, things like that, as well as some of the oral testimonies um, like Esther Arma, for example, artist activist who is absolutely brilliant and up here with hers. Um, is of Ghanaian descent, she's Ghanaian. And she talks about how, um, if you had said to her grandparents, what is a homosexual? They would have been like, we don't have that. We don't know what that means. Right. And she said, many Americans misinterpret that to mean that there were no homosexuals in Ghana. But what she really means is that the Ghanaians had no reason to separate homosexuality from heterosexuality because there was nothing strange or different or anything needing to be ostracized about the queer experience. It was all love, all sex. Um, Arma says um, sexuality was like land. There were no boundaries. Right. And so we come to it with our colonial mindsets that you know wants to box and label everything so that we can create the hierarchy. So um, it, it took a lot of research and I drew from a lot of different African um, communities. It's not so it, um, the community that I'm talking about here is actually an amalgam yes. of several different communities because I wanted to pick the things that made them wholly different from Western ideas about gender and sexuality and race and so on and so forth. Created this, I don't want to call it a utopian society because it's not utopian and I, I make that clear in the, um, in the um, later chapters, but something that lets the black reader know that our understanding of even spirituality is not our understanding. And there was something that came before and here is what it looked like. And maybe that can help us get back to a place where we are indeed united as tribe. Yes, yes. Um, all right, we got seven more minutes before I can ask you big questions before we get to the um, listeners big questions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm interested, Robert, if we can talk a bit about responsibility when, when, when channeling and listening to elders. One of the things I think you do brilliantly in this book is every time you could create a character who is ultimately impenetrable and um, either completely virtuous or completely uh, despicable, you complicate it, right? You complicate it, you complicate it, you complicate it. So here's a question I really want to ask you, fam. And I should have asked you this privately, but I'm fucking, we, we here. <laughs> How, if at all, has your understanding of American publishing changed since the prophets was signed, released, and understandably, so far, I'm just going to use the word appreciated. Has your understanding of American literature, publishing, publishing, I let because different, changed at all since you created a book that will dictate how writers going forward write? I'm asking that shit because my imagination never made space for this book. I told you this privately. I was trying to write something like The Prophets when I was doing Long Division and I couldn't pull it off. I pulled off what I could pull off. I couldn't pull off The Prophets. This shit is too good. It's too textured. It's too layered. You're too fucking smart. But the shit has changed, right? Or has it? Like, has your understanding of this, of this industry changed since now we're talking on, the, on this thing right here about Robert Jones as The Prophets? You know, I was quite lucky to, to um, thanks to people like you, Kiese, of meeting the right people who shielded me from a lot of the horrors that I had been told about. Um, so for example, without throwing any particular publisher under the bus, um, when The Prophets was being shopped and um, the publishers were bidding on it. The highest bidder 
actually made very clear to me in no uncertain terms that they were going to significantly change what this book was about and who this book was for. Um, and made no bones about it. Was just wanting to, to be very, very clear that the prophets needed to, how can I say this diplomatically, appeal more to a mainstream audience. I'll, I'll put it like that. <laughs> we need Baldwin here. <laughs> You mean those Ophays? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I said, um, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. I said, no, sir. Nah. And um, I went with a publisher where the editor and I were here. And I had the freedom to do that because of people like PJ Mark, who um, provided very wise counsel. So the industry is now um, sort of, they, they know they're under a microscope now. So they're trying to, to do things um, in a way that um, marginalized voices are more central. But my grandmother used to say, you look at the earlobes and you could tell you can't trust them. Yeah. That's, that's what she, I, I actually that's put that book. in the book. It's in the book. It's in the book. <laughs> that's I was your grandmama in the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we are in a white supremacist capitalist patriarchy and even people with good intentions are gonna act as the country has trained them to act. So given that this is my first novel, I've never really had that much interaction with the publishing industry to know the, the horrors about it, to, to know that my opinion has changed one way or another about the industry. But I do know that marginalized people, Black people in particular, should be very cautious of and, and particular in who they choose to be in their circle. Um, they should choose people who um, are committed to their vision, um, who only want to make their works, um, I don't wanna say better, but more, can, more uh, like laser focused so that it's like beyond reproach. Right. Um, but we, we always have to, we, we still have to be careful um, that, that I don't think that's gonna ever go away as long as um, white supremacist capitalist patriarchs are in charge and, and everywhere and anywhere and people who wanna be white supremacist capitalist patriarchs of all races, genders, and so on and so forth. Absolutely. Um, all right, I got one more minute with you, fam, before we open this up. Um, Mississippi. Uh, why? Why Mississippi for this for this book? I, I'm I'm gonna tell you. There's two reasons. Tell me. One, it's set in Vicksburg on purpose because of Bea Richards. Yes. Um, I I adored her, and I wanted to somehow pay a small bit of tribute to her. So I picked Mississippi. The other reason is because Mississippi's racist history is just so rich and thick to be mined, to be examined, to be ripped open, to be um, pointed at and talked about. Um, even my family's roots is, are Southern. So my family is from Savannah, Georgia and Dillon, South Carolina. Even in Savannah and Dillon, they're like, yo, but in Mississippi, mm -hmm. they living in the heart of racism and they're still looking at Mississippi going, but they are worse. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to go to what I think is the beating heart of racism in America, um, which is Mississippi. And I also wanted to go to the beating heart of black resistance in America, which is also Mississippi. Oh. <laughs> which is also Mississippi. The, the most courageous, 
the most wise, the most intelligent, the most creative black people on earth came out of Mississippi. And I wanted to pay homage to that. Thank you, fam. Um, we got 20 minutes. Let's get some people's questions in, in, in here and, 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 and broaden this community. Thank you so much for talking to me for a second. I'm gonna I'm I'm dip in there a, a little bit more um, as we go on. So the book is 14 years in the making. Did you ever have moments of feeling unworthy of the vision and what kept you going? This is from Isabel. Isabel, yes. Um, every moment that I was writing this book, I thought I'm not good enough to do this. Um, it's taking me too long. Um, white people are gonna attack me because I'm, I'm talking about racism. Straight people are gonna attack me because I'm talking about queerness. Is it worth it? Um, am I up to this? And I kept hearing the whispers, um, whether that was my own consciousness talking to me or genuinely ancestors pushing me. I felt shame and guilt when I woke up and didn't write a sentence. Wow. And that's what kept pushing me to, and you know, I had to work. Like, so in grad school, I had two part-time jobs. In undergrad, I had three part-time jobs. When I graduated from grad school, I had a full-time job that took a lot of my creative energy. And so it was difficult to find the energy and the time to write this book, but yet my gut kept pulling me towards it. Like, so I'd get up at three o'clock in the morning and write a paragraph and go back to sleep and, and stuff like that. I'd write on the bus and the trains. And the fact that I kept going after all of this time started to give me a little bit of, well, maybe I am supposed to write this if I haven't given up. If I haven't given up on myself, then maybe I'm, I am supposed to be writing this. And so that, I, I won't say that I, I was courageous because it didn't feel like courage to me. It felt like fear and me doing it anyway. I feel you, fam. Um, we'll have so much to say, but let me, let me let's, 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 let's be cool about this. Um, all right, so another, another, another question is, how has your physical experience affected the writing of this work? Your sleep, your breathing, how did nourishment affect this narrative? We talked about this a bit. I think that might be a good question to dive into. I am I am so glad this person asked this question because I'm gonna reveal something that I have not revealed publicly. Um, last year, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And so um, what multiple sclerosis does, it has a, a profound, um, impact on your physicality. So it's, um, there were days where my whole entire right side went numb and to touch something felt like I was touching fire. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't even type to write. So what I would do was I would press record on my iPhone and talk to get the words down because I just could not stop writing. Um, also, I was working at a job that was incredibly toxic um, and it was having an effect on my, um, my mental health in terms of, you know, I was sad all the time. I was um, listless. I didn't want to do anything. I would lay down in bed and pull the covers over my head or, or just veg out watching TV instead of doing the work. But again, um, the commitment to my ancestors. Um, for example, I recently found out that my grandfather's eldest brother, born in 1897, came to America in 1906, was gay. But in his time, there was no gay. You got married and that was it. If you had to do your little thing, you went to the park at midnight and did whatever you had to do. Right. So, he never got to tell his story. So I'm writing for Uncle Milton. Um, I'm writing for all of those um, nameless, faceless black queer people who um, according to America didn't begin showing up until 1929 in, in, in the Harlem Renaissance. Right. Um, 
and that pushed me to go past the pain of the of the MS, um, past the depression of working at a job that did not honor me. Um, I had this, and and so it it came down to me knowing the difference between what I was doing to survive and what I was doing that was my purpose. And thankfully, the purpose won out. Wow. Danielle, who asked that question, says she also has MS. So wow. thank you, thank you, fam, for, for um, sharing that with us. Uh, all right, Jamie asked, without spoiling, OK. Maggie's character. There's so many things you can spoil in this book. I think that's tied to like the comics. I want to talk about the comics in a bit, but okay. let's, get, let's get some more questions in here. Um, where do we, where are we? We are, uh, oh, okay. Let's, I want to come back to that question. To what extent did you as Robert embody and son of Baldwin compel you to pin the profits? To what extent did walking in such an enormous shadow threatened to inhibit your writing. That's Ooh. from Jetta Mayberry. Love that brother. You know, people like uh, Morrison and Baldwin only inspire me. Mm -hmm. Like, I will never write like Toni Morrison, but I am gonna keep trying to reach that level of excellence. Um, I'll, I'll never do it. I can't touch the hem of her garment, but maybe one day I could bow before her, you know, like, so they don't intimidate me. They just make, make me feel like, oh, you can do that. Oh, I'm going to try. I'm going to try. I'm going to try. Like when I read Alice Walker, when I read Wallace Thurman, when I read Kiese Lehman, let me tell y'all something about Heavy. I haven't seen the investigation of that book. I'm gonna have to write it because I, I haven't seen the investigation of that book because there's so much going on in that book and everybody is staying real surface with it. But Heavy is one of the most profound memoirs I have ever read in my life. Like, and I'm going back centuries. That's what I wanna do. I wanna do stuff like Kiese is doing. I wanna try. Um, and maybe fail, but I want to try. So um, I never feel inhibited by Baldwin, Morrison, Walker, Butler. I feel liberated by them. Yes. Um, fam, I'm just so happy we try it. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> reduced to just some, like, just some little kids, fuck it, you know, like, you know, we out there, we in this fucking sand pit and we touching on each other's faces and somebody over here making some shit and somebody over here making some real elaborate shit and somebody over here making something that seems mad basic, but it's um, but it's just like the making, like the attempt to try given what Morrison and Baldwin have given us, right? You, you see Disha out here being um Gloria Naylor, right? <laughs> I, that's what I say. That's what, yo, I want in my dreams, my G, I got Gloria Naylor and Disha. Not just sitting down, but standing up talking. You know, it's the difference between that stand up talking and that sit down talking. <laughs> <laughs> but like Deisha and Gloria Naylor, uh, 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 Ellison and, and 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 Maurice, like you and fucking all of these. I I I I, I'm corny, fam. Like I just love when we play with the people who enabled us to play and fight. Cause ain't no good fight without no play. And that's one of the things I love about the book, the playfulness. Like you end chapters with laughs. You literally end a chapter in this book with ha, 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 ha. And in this book, the, this book of this depth in this way, let's, you, you spoke of Disha. I want to get Disha and I want to get Amina. Disha says, in what ways does the prophets embody slash perform resistance? Ooh. Um from a metatextual sense, it's giving the enslaved their interiority. Because mm -hmm. so often in books about this time period, the slavery is the character and the enslaved are just, you know, the background. Mm -hmm. um, in this, slavery was the background, but the enslaved are the characters. Like, 
Yes. Maggie, for example, no, she can't escape. You know, she's, she's disabled, she can't escape. But she can grind up some glass and put it in your biscuits. <laughs> she can do a lot, yes. <laughs> you know, um, Samuel and Isaiah are enslaved, but Samuel can turn to Isaiah and say, don't get up now, sleep a little bit more because you're gonna have to just go out there and work for that, that, that thing over there anyway. Take two more minutes, they're yours. Um, so we often think of resistance in this like big sort of revolt type way, but our ancestors, many of them had the tiny resistances of taking their time, pretending they didn't hear you call them from the field, mm. putting a little Shug Avery P in your water. Right. <laughs> you <know? Right>. um, <laughs> so um, yes, there, there were big resistances. That's one of the things in my research, people don't know how many times um, there were revolts, like violent revolts. There were like hundreds and thousands of violent revolts. Kanye West could say whatever he want about slavery being a choice. Our people fought back every step <laughs> of the way, well, all no, the time. Fam. And they, they mm -hmm. erased that from the record because they don't want us to know that right. down in New Orleans, there was this big revolt and, and we lost, our ancestors lost. And as a result, these slave masters cut off all their heads and, and put them on spikes for miles. That is American history, but they don't tell us that part. They just tell us the part about us singing songs and, and, and um, picking cotton, but they don't tell us about how we took the pitchfork and stuck it in master's face. Mm -hmm. They don't want us to know that part. Right, right. So we have to, 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 to sing it, to, to, to write it, to whisper it. Um, and then we have to hear it, right? Right. Okay, so this is, this, is a, this, is, this is tied to the comic that I wanted to get into um, from Amina. Robert just began the book, it's so powerful. There's so many layers to it. You're doing the melody, the harmony, the background vocals with ease and its lyricism. My hope next is that you do a graphic novel or comic. Your voice through this book in Son of Baldwin is so powerful. As an avid comic book fan, is this something you have considered? Could you answer that and talk about the way the comic, the way your your appreciation for the comic actually helped you deal with like plotting? Can we talk about that too? Okay. Um, I have considered writing comics. I'm, I'm so disappointed with modern day comics, it's at least mainstream modern day comics. Although, N.K. Jameson is writing this book called Far Sector with a black woman who's a Green Lantern and Jamal Campbell on art. Yo, that book is so fire. Like, it is like, how, how, how does everybody not have this book? It is absolute fire. N.K. Jameson's imagination, first of all, is otherworldly. She is just brilliant on every single level. One-on-one. -on -one. And then Jamal Campbell's art is alive. It, it is literally alive. And so if I could do a comic book like that, I would do it. Um, but racism and misogyny are so embedded in that industry that it would probably have to be like an independent book or something like that. It probably could not be with the mainstream publishers because they, um, although DC is trying to move out of this mode, they have a um, an audience that they think they have to pander to, much <laughs> like um, Democrats when they want to um, say we got to join hands with Trump supporters and stuff like right, that. They right. they think the minority is the, is where they should be putting their um, energy. So I don't want to I don't want to have to deal with that. But I would love to write a comic one day. Um, Wonder Woman is one of my favorite characters. I would love to write her in a way that I think um, radically feminist. Um, how she should be in terms of um, her, her politics, which I haven't seen in a long time. Although Kelly Sue DeConnick is about to come out with this book called Wonder Woman Historia, where she's telling the history of the Amazons from the Amazon's point of view, and it's gonna be fire. Phil Jimenez on art. Um, and then in terms of how reading comic books um, maybe informed plot movement in the prophets, you know, Sally Kim said that. She, uh, my editor, Sally Kim said to me, you know, I can actually see 
in how you structured this book, how this could be, um, how comics could have influenced that. Yes. I don't know. I, I, I don't know what it is. Like, cause I've been reading comic books since I was four. So like, I, if it's in there, I don't notice it. And unless somebody can point it out to me to be like, oh, this, how you structured this is very much like the, um, in that genre. But I, I don't really see it. I don't, like, I don't know. <laughs> All right, all right, all right. I'm gonna try to get as many in in this next four minutes. Um, yeah, we should talk about that because I see it in the pacing, um, mm -hmm. which is which is hard to pull off. I think if 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 one of your gifts is the line, right, the sentence, and that's one of your gifts, right? Like you can you can spend sentences, but a lot of people who spend sentences can't can't propel, stop, clip short, make you want to turn the page. Jamie, this is the question I wanted to ask without spoiling. Maggie's character experiences what you call a cage of visions. And that visions holds a key to the cage. I'm wondering how this relates to your identity as a writer and change agent. In what ways are we as readers slash writers stuck in this cage? And how do you work to provide a key? That is a deep doggone question. Oh. Cage of visions. And how are we as writers stuck in it? Yeah, I have to think about that. That that's that one is a, a cool one. That's a, that's a flex. That's a whole that's a flex. flex. <laughs> <laughs> let me say, let me flex right quick. All right, um, I think I know. Who, I think I know that Jamie. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a follow up with that. Um, all right, incredible question. This might this might take us out. Let's see. I'm interested in how vulnerability expresses itself in the book. How did you approach the complex task of writing black men? who face the ugliness of being vulnerable subjects in a system of oppression, while also capturing the beauty of them sharing vulnerability with each other. And I will add also their complicity in parts of the system in this book. Can we talk about that? Um, I wrote Black men in a way that I hoped that Black men could be in real life in that understanding that our strength oftentimes is in our vulnerability, right. our ability to ask for help, um, our ability to um, be soft. Because think of what Toni Morrison has Paul D say to Setha in Beloved. Yeah. He says, a man ain't an ax, Setha. He, he can't be chopping away all day things get to him inside things. When we insist that men be hard, aggressive, protector, provider, um, all of these hard things, because we think, oh, that's just by biology, that's what men are supposed to be. Yes. We, we cut them in half. We, we, we create, for lack of a better term, the monster. That is where, where these young boys are told anything soft about you is wrong. And then they grow up being the hardest things to everybody. And then we go, why are they like that? Right. <laughs> because we have pounded that into their heads that they can't be soft or, or anything. So I know it's so hard for black men in a society that is after us all the time, for black people in general, but for black men in particular, in a, a society where masculinity is constructed in this, in this particular way, that strength and dominance is manhood, to show any little vulnerability, you, you, you think that you, you're losing your manhood. I wanted to show two men in danger who had a complicated relationship to vulnerability because Samuel has one way of trying to deal right. with it and Isaiah has another. Um, like you said, they are implicated um, and they implicate each other. Yeah. Um, but I still wanted to envision, well, what would it look like if two black men in danger were, were, were vulnerable too? Um, how would they, deal with harms? Where would be their safe spaces? Um, what would be the reaction of other people to them? And would other people look at them and say, okay, 
they're they're susceptible to harm, so I'm gonna harm them. Right. So just really wrestling with a lot of ideas there and trying to find answers to questions that I have for myself. Um, all right, I'm gonna let you go. Two questions though, because people keep on wanting to get this 10 books, but can you say again where you, you've listed the 10 books that impacted you? And is it on your Instagram or do you want to say those 10? But that's not the last question I want to ask, but let's get, get, let's get this question out because okay. people keep on hitting, hitting me with that. Um, I don't know if I'm going to remember all 10, but I will name as many as I can remember. Um, so it's Long Division by Kiese Lehman, Flesh and the Devil by Cola Booth, Go Tell It on the Mountain by James Baldwin, The Black of the Berry by Wallace Thurman, The Color Purple by Alice Walker, Mama Day by Gloria Naylor, Beloved by Toni Morrison, I've got three more, um, Kindred by Octavia Butler, um, their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. I got nine. That's really good. Um, <laughs> I don't know what the 10th one is. That's all right, fam, because you, you, they can go look on your shit. You know what I mean? Like, um, they can go pick this up. They can go I find will, books. I will, I will post it on Son of Baldwin after this interview so that everybody can see it. All right, yes. And, and, and Let's here- go to Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. I'll post it on all three. Final question, and um, I just want to say, I just want to thank everybody for coming out and being so generous tonight with their time on this Tuesday night. Um, you know, a lot going on in the world right now. And also, fam, like, I literally love you so, so much. I, I, I can't wait, or I hope we can make it through whatever's happening so we can hug appropriately, you know, laugh in each other's ears appropriately. You know, I can dap you up, you can dap my people up. <laughs> I, I, I love you, fam. I, I I love you. I love you. I'm in awe of what you have done for my inside, selfishly, and I'm really in awe for what you've done for our people with this with this book. And by and this this earth this earth is is about to shake, y'all. Please go out and buy the prophets. Last questions. How did the queer characters of Morrison and Baldwin's respective oobs impact not just thought of Samuel and Isaiah's queerness? Let me ask that again. This is from Jatella. How did the queer characters of Morrison and Baldwin's respective oobs impact not just thought of Samuel and Isaiah's queerness? Impact how you thought, I'm sorry. How did the queer characters of Morrison and Baldwin's books impact how you thought of Samuel and, and, and Isaiah's queerness? Well, for, for Morrison, the question that just kept coming up for me in her work is, I, I saw instances of sexual assault that involved same sex, same gender individuals, but I never saw any instances of love. And that, that led me to the question, well, what about love? Which eventually led me to writing this book. In Baldwin's work, particularly in Go Tell It on the Mountain, there's a playfulness between um, Baldwin's, uh, the character that's suppo- uh, supposed right. to be Baldwin and yeah. Elisha the, the, the older uh, church boy in the book where there's this sexual tension underneath this adolescent sexual tension. That helped me to kind of craft how um, Samuel and Isaiah as, as younger people might have um, danced around their attraction to one another, how, how they would have engaged with it in this sort of um, manly, or, or boyish way. Um, but then again, Baldwin, um, he did, interestingly enough, in his most famous queer work, um, he didn't really write about black queer people. He wrote about white queer people because he thought it would be too much at the time for, for, for the character to be both black and queer. But in later works, he, he gets, gets to that. And um, he's really crucial in, um, my understanding of how to render um, the complex and complicated nature of love. Yes. Um, all right, fam, I'm just, thank you for making me so happy. Uh, thank you for creating a book that, 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 that's gonna guide us for, for, for a long, long, long time. And 
Um, and I want to thank Greenlight for giving us space to, to, to love up on each other. Um, please, y'all, go out and get the profits. Let's do this again after people have read it so we can really, really talk and get people's questions. I'm, I'm saying let's just do it, fam, if you're open for it. I'm totally open for it. Kiese, um, anybody who knows me knows how much I adore you. Um, as I said at, at the beginning of this, the profits would not have been in the world if not for you. Like you literally were the catalyst for this to get into somebody's hands, to get into the world, to get into people's hands. Like if, if it were not for you, I would not be here talking. And I, I also am in awe of the way you love us. Um, I aspire to that. You are just so open and free and giving of your time and, and of your art. And I just adore you. Wow. Thank you. Fam. Thank you. Thank y'all. Thank y'all so much. I'm crying, but I, I have to come back <laughs> on and say good night. I want to say thank you so much to both of you guys. Thanks to everybody who's here. Um, get the profits. If you haven't got it already, I'm dropping the buy link in the chat again. If you missed any of this conversation or you just want to live it again, um, we're going to have it on Greenlight Bookstore's YouTube channel within the next couple of days. So come, come take a look at it. Everybody have a beautiful night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Kiese. Thank you, thank brother. Greenlight. Thank you, Greenlight. Holla, y'all.